In the year 1906, there was a monumental shift in capital ship construction by the Royal Navy when they built HMS Dreadnought. Up until this point, battleships followed a similar pattern of construction, with usually a main battery of 12-inch or 305mm guns and twin turrets with one fore and one aft. Along with that, the ship could carry other large caliber guns as well, like 8 and 9 inch or 203 and 254 millimeter guns, and other secondary, tertiary, and even quaternary batteries. What made Dreadnought so different is that the ship's main armament was a uniform battery of 12 inch or 305 millimeter guns. Now, this was such a radical shift that almost all other capital ships in the world were now obsolete. Along with that, all the capital ships before her were dubbed pre-dreadnoughts due to the change in ship design, and succeeding ships could be described as dreadnoughts in the different generations that succeeded her. Not to mention, as the capital ships grew in size, caliber, and amount of guns, the term super dreadnought started to be used. Even though the ship did not really do a whole lot in its career, its design was one of the most important ones of the early 20th century. The idea for an all-large caliber gun design for a ship had been floated around in naval design circles for a little while now. Naval powers were starting to realize that the battle ranges might be a little bit longer than previously anticipated and might need more large caliber guns to reach those ranges effectively. Along with that, people feared the introduction of torpedoes with longer ranges, which would discourage ships from closing into one another to use their quick-firing short-range guns. One of the main proponents of an all-big gun design was Italian naval architect Vittorio Cuniberti, who advocated for this design for the Italian Navy but was rejected so he wrote in journals advocating for his designs. Now, navies like the Imperial Japanese Navy and the United States Navy had realized the need for an all-big gun design as well, and were working on them, with the United States producing the South Carolina class and the Japanese producing the Satsuma, which was a sort of in-between design. Now, the Royal Navy needed to stay ahead of the rest of these navies, and thankfully for them, the British had an advocate for these designs, and by October of 1904, he was the first Sea Lord of the Admiralty, Jackie Fisher. To which, he pushed through the board of the Admiralty a decision to arm the next battleship with 12-inch guns and that it would have a top speed of no less than 21 knots. This was a rather difficult process of designing due to cost constraints and the Admiralty's skeptical eye on the project. Fisher had set up a committee on designs and made a number of changes to save costs and learn from recent experiences of the Russo-Japanese War from their ally Japan. They decided to add more armor to the bulkhead to protect the magazines from underwater explosions. Another crucial decision they made was to delay orders for any other ships until Dreadnought's trials had been completed due to her experimental nature. Dreadnought would displace around 18,400 tons standard displacement and around 21,000 tons full load. She would be powered by 18 coal-fired boilers that powered two turbines that drove four screws, producing around 23,000 shaft horsepower, giving her that 21 knots that Fisher wanted. Another feature that made her so revolutionary was she was the first battleship to use steam turbines instead of triple expansion steam engines. Her main armament was 10 12-inch or 305mm guns in twin turrets with one forward, two aft, and two turrets on the side of the ships. Her secondary battery would consist of single 3-inch or 76mm guns, which I could not find an exact amount. I've seen 10, 24, and 27 in total, so if anyone has an exact amount, please put it in the comments along with five underwater torpedo tubes to round out her weaponry. Her armor would consist of a belt with a thickness of between 4 and 11 inches, or 102 and 279 millimeters, and a deck of between 3 fourths of an inch and 3 inches, or 19 and 76 millimeters of armor. Her turrets would have between 3 and 12 inches of armor, or 76 and 305 millimeters of armor. She would be laid down in October of 1905, launched in February of 1906, and commissioned in December of that year. Another revolutionary feature that Dreadnought had that's important to talk about was her fire control system. She was one of the first vessels of the Royal Navy to be fitted with the instruments for electrically transmitting the necessary information for gunnery to the turrets. Voice pipes were retained as a secondary means of conveying this information, but it's just another thing that made Dreadnought such a big leap in design. In December of 1906, she sailed for the Mediterranean Sea for extensive trials and returned to the UK in March of 1907. During the shakedown cruise, her engines and guns were given a good workout. The shakedown cruise proved useful because it revealed issues that were fixed in subsequent refits. Then, from 1907 to 1911, she served in the Royal Navy's home fleet. In March of 1911, she was assigned to the 1st Division of the home fleet, participating in King George V's coronation fleet review in June of 1911. 
In December of 1912, she was again transferred to the 4th Battle Squadron and became flagship of it, leading it in training exercises in September and December of 1913. She would be the flagship of the 4th Battle Squadron in the North Sea, based out of Scapa Flow, but was quickly relieved as flagship by HMS Benbow when the First World War kicked off. One of her most significant actions of the war was ramming and sinking the German submarine SMU-29 on the 18th of March 1915, cutting the submarine in two and almost colliding with HMS Temeraire in the process. She missed the Battle of Jutland on May 31, 1916 due to some previous repair work. She became flagship of the 3rd Battle Squadron on July 9th, based out of the River Thames, which was a force of pre-dreadnoughts intended to counter the threat of offshore bombardment by German battle cruisers. Then, by March of 1918, she returned to the Grand Fleet, resuming her role as flagship of the 4th Battle Squadron. But, shortly after, her career would be over. By 1920, she would be sold for scrap, and thus ended the career for such a revolutionary ship. HMS Dreadnought was a very significant ship for world history. Her name would be generically used as a term for future battleships all across the world. Her uniform main battery became a standard practice for all navies after her construction. Although being such a large part of naval history due to her design, her career was a rather unremarkable one besides ramming and sinking a submarine. Nevertheless, her importance can be seen throughout successive designs in the Royal Navy and other navies throughout the world.